A shark biologist and his family encounter a new species of shark that is killing people on an island. Can they find a way to stop its killing spree? Let us find out in the movie version of the 1998 miniseries titled Creature. One rainy night in the year 1972, a Navy admiral named Tony Richland pays a visit to a government research facility on a Caribbean island. He is greeted by Lieutenant Thomas Penniston, the trusted assistant of Dr. Ernest Bishop, who is the lead scientist in the facility. At the elevator, Tony asks how long it has been since Thomas started watching over the project, to which the lieutenant says nine months. Thomas then guides Tony inside the research facility and introduces him to Ernest. Seeing him, Ernest seems not to be happy, saying that he asks for more funding, not a site visitor. In turn, Tony argues that the U.S. government already gave him millions of dollars for his quote-unquote dolphin experiment, which is why they sent him to assess the situation first before releasing another million to Ernest. He also questions why the scientist wants more money for safety and security. In order to answer the admiral, Ernest orders Thomas to open the cage, revealing the products of his experiment, the hybrids of dolphins and sharks. Seeing them, Tony is in shock and asks how Ernest did it. According to the scientist, it is a process of hybridization that is commonly done in plants which are joining two DNAs together until they produce an entirely new species. Yet, Ernest boasts that what they have is a special kind of hybrid. At this time, they drop three mannequins into the water, two dressed up as military while one is a terrorist, carrying a signal responder. Ernest explains that his hybrids are highly sensitive to sound and are trained to respond to specific electronic stimulations. And to Tony's surprise, the hybrids only attack the terrorist mannequin, not minding the other two. The scientist continues, saying that the hybrids retain 41% of their dolphin trait, making them possible to train, while the remaining 59% have the shark trait, which is being vicious predators. In this way, the Navy can weaponize the hybrids against any threat to the waters. Suddenly, a cage behind them, which happens to contain another form of shark hybrid, makes noise. Ernest thinks that the attack beacon triggers the hybrid inside the cage, which leads to Tony asking what makes it different from other hybrids. Thomas answers him, stating that it is a special form of hybrid and the exact reason why they need more funds for security and safety. This makes Tony more confused than before. Noticing it, Ernest asks if he is familiar with the theory that states that all organisms repeat their evolutionary steps, but Tony doesn't have any idea about what they are talking about. Just then, the cage of the mysterious hybrid opens. Seeing this, Ernest says that the hybrid is beginning to learn. As it turns out, this specific hybrid is a product combining a human's and a shark's DNA, and it has the ability to adapt to any kind of environment that it is put into. Thomas and the other staff try to stop the cage seal from opening, but they all fail miserably. The human shark hybrid finally escapes, then goes straight eating the dolphin shark hybrids. Another staff tries to stop the human shark hybrid by electrocuting it, but Ernest stops the staff from hurting his creation, causing him and the staff to accidentally fall into the water. And just like that, Ernest's own creation eats and kills him. Thomas can't do anything as he witnesses his boss death while Tony blindly shoots at the water. Afterward, Thomas notices that the hybrid is gone. Worse, the pathway of the sea is open. Realizing the potential danger if the hybrid gets out in the open water, Thomas runs to the boat and traps the hybrid in the cage. At this time, Thomas sails as he hears Tony in the PA system, ordering him to kill the hybrid. Grabbing the rifle, Thomas musters up all his courage to end it right then and there. However, for some unknown reason, he breaks down and asks for forgiveness as he cuts the rope of the cage, causing it to submerge at the bottom of the sea. 25 years later, in the sea near the island where the incident happened, a shark biologist named Dr. Simon Chase and his friend-slash-assistant known as Tall Man detect a great white shark that is not moving. Simon thinks that it must have been caught in one of the fishermen's traps, so he decides to go where the shark is. There he sees a man named Ben Mediera and his crew casually fishing. As they approach Ben's boat, Simon talks to them calmly and explains that great white sharks are already endangered, so he asks them to just let it go. Despite his plea, Ben declines, telling Simon and Tall Man to leave them alone, challenging him that if he can free the shark, then they will let it go. Hearing this, Simon accepts the challenge without a second thought and manages to do it in no time. Surprised, Ben and his crew leave, muttering that they will come back for the shark. Meanwhile, in another part of the sea, another fisherman named Adam Puckett is trying to catch some big fish by using a hook when he suddenly picks up a cage. It is then revealed that this cage is the one where the hybrid is trapped for 25 years already. And to make matters worse, as Puckett pulls the cage out of the water, it is already opened, meaning that the hybrid is now free.
Some time later, Ben and his crew indeed come back to the spot where they initially caught the great white shark. As the kid starts pouring meat and blood into the water to attract the shark, his headphones also fall into the sea as well. Calling Ben for help, the kid gets scolded for using his gadget while working. But as Ben reaches for the headphones, the hybrid pulls him into the water, killing him. At the same time, Simon and Tall pick up Simon's ex-wife Dr. Amanda Macy and their son Max at the airport. They also bring with them Amanda's pet, which is a sea lion. Although they are divorced, Simon and Amanda stay as good friends for the sake of their son and they will stay on the island for Max to be with Simon for seven weeks. As they arrive at the main island, Max tells his parents that he will stroll for a while using his roller skates. Just then, a crazy man, who turns out to be Thomas, shows up while howling like a wolf. Taking this as a bad omen, Amanda tells her son not to go, but Simon says otherwise, insisting that the island is safe. When Max is gone, Amanda tells Simon that he should be strict with his son, even just for some time. Yet, Simon just points out that Max is not a kid anymore. Upon strolling in the streets of the island, all eyes are on Max as the locals see a new outsider living on their island. Then, he comes across a group of teenagers who initially pick on him for being an outsider. They challenge him that if he can jump from a cliff and stay underwater for some time, they will accept him. Seeing a beautiful girl in the group named Elizabeth Gibson, Max accepts the challenge. Going back to the port, a commotion is taking place as the people try to get a look at what remains of Ben. The island authority calls Simon to check if it is caused by a shark attack. Upon observing the body, Simon says it is not. But the local police chief named Raleigh Gibson, Elizabeth's father, believes otherwise, pointing out that the kid in Ben's crew saw how a shark pulled and killed Ben. Hearing this, Simon states that sharks do not pull people into the water in case of an attack. He also adds that the great white shark is pregnant so she will not dare to attack anyone. However, Raleigh holds on to his belief that the great white shark did it. When Simon and Amanda decide to leave the port, Thomas is seen observing the dead body from afar. Meanwhile, Tallman is with his girlfriend when a fisherman mocks him for working with Simon. Hearing this, Tallman just drags his girlfriend away, not wanting to cause any more trouble. After the incident with Ben, the people of the island lose their trust in Simon and start preparing to either catch or kill the shark. Concurrently, Thomas is scavenging when he sees the Hydra's cage in Puckett's truck. Seeing it again for the first time after 25 years, Thomas knows that more people will die aside from Ben. Worse, he sees eggshells inside the cage, meaning there could be more hybrids roaming around the sea right now. Some time later, Simon, Amanda, and Tall Man are in their boat, and Simon is trying to call for help to locate the shark and protect it. Failing to get some help, Simon states his frustrations that great white sharks are still not considered endangered just because they are not mammals and cute. At this time Max, along with Elizabeth who became really close to him right away, comes back to them to ask permission to go to the other side of the island. As expected, Amanda doesn't want to allow him to go. Max looks to his father for backup, which he gets, but Simon tells him to be back before 6 p.m. so they can have dinner together. Pocket then butts in, telling Max to be careful around sharks, purposely taunting Simon. In turn, Simon warns him to not put his traps around the island, which might cause the death of the sharks. But Pocket says he will just go look for the great white shark and kill it to sell its jaws. Then, Thomas suddenly appears in front of Amanda, scaring her. As Simon takes her to the boat, Thomas is blabbering about an island, but most of it is incomprehensible. They continue on their way and sail to look for the shark and let Amanda's sea lion go for a swim. However, Simon gets no luck in finding his great white shark. Afterward, they head to the research island where Simon takes the facility as his own office. There they give the sea lion a permanent home while they are on the island. Amanda also sees some family photos of them and a man named Brian. Tall man sees her reminiscing, commenting Simon used to tell him a story about Brian, Simon's younger brother, who unfortunately died of cancer. This caused Simon's obsession with studying sharks after he read an article about something in this animal that can cure cancer. It became Simon's world that later on affects their marriage and family. Tall man then states that his father always tells him that all men are born to hunt. Without something to gain, achieve, or pursue, life is not worth living. Tall man understands and respects Simon, which is why he chose to work with him. Later, Simon and Amanda talk, in which Amanda asks how much he knows about the research facility. According to Simon, the Navy told him that the place was used during the Vietnam War for some classified dolphin research, teaching the animals how to place mines on enemy ships. On the main island, Max is already next in line to jump off the cliff when the leader of the group teases him that he will not last long underwater. 
Hearing this, Elizabeth tells Max that he doesn't need to do it, but he is determined to do so. When the leader jumps off, Max follows shortly after, wanting to prove himself to Elizabeth. And to everyone's shock, the water suddenly turns red. It is then revealed that the hybrid is in the area and it attacks the group leader, missing Max because it is too busy mauling the other teenager. Everyone screams in terror and runs while Max swims as fast as he can to get away from the creature. The incident causes another panic among the people of the island and Raleigh is blaming Simon once again for protecting the great white shark. But Simon insists that it is not what is causing all these attacks. In turn, Max tells his father that what attacked them was indeed a shark, only that it doesn't look like any other shark that they have seen. According to him, its body is not smooth, but rather has ripples. At this time, another doctor approaches Simon and gives him a tooth they recovered from the dead body. And to his surprise, it is indeed a shark tooth, but what puzzles him is that it has roots, which is not normal for sharks. Also adding to the problem is Pucket, who agitates the people of the island, saying that he caused the recent deaths by allowing the great white shark to roam in their waters. Yet, Simon and his family decide not to engage with them anymore to prevent any more problems from arising. Instead, they sail to go back to the island. Simon shows the shark's teeth to Amanda, and she points out that only mammals have roots in their teeth. Then all of a sudden, they detect the great white shark nearby, but it is not alone as another shark appears on the radar, and it attacks the great white shark. It turns out to be the hybrid shark, and they manage to have a glimpse of it through the underwater camera. Confused at what they just saw, Simon and Amanda head out as the hybrid charges at the board. Acting quickly, Simon takes the machete and cuts off one of the creature's fingers. The following day, everyone on the island rejoices as Puckett finally kills and catches the great white shark. But what is weird is that it is full of scratches that obviously didn't come from any of his traps. Simon, on the other hand, tells Raleigh that killing the great white shark is a mistake, revealing to him what they encountered last night. However, the police chief couldn't care less. What is important to him is that the great white shark is already dead, still believing that it's what killed his people. Just then, Max challenges him to open up the shark to see if it has any human remains inside, but Puckett declines, not wanting anyone to touch his quote-unquote trophy. Worse, Raleigh sides with Puckett and orders everyone to leave. Without anyone on the island willing to help, Simon and Amanda start using their connections to call for help from outsiders. Simon even tells one of his colleagues in the field that he will name the creature after him if it turns out to be a new species, but without proper evidence to show, they still cannot get what they need. Finally, he calls the Navy and the Marine he talks to inform Tony Richland about his claims. Because of this, Tony contacts Simon, and upon confirming that it is about the human-shark hybrid, he orders Simon to keep the existence of the creature secret and just do nothing about it, saying that the Army will be the ones to deal with it. After the call, Simon and Amanda believe that the Navy knows well what is going on on the island and that they have something to do with it. Later that night, they head back to the research facility on the other island. And to their surprise, Thomas is there, blowing a horn like he is trying to call the attention of the creature. Simon asks what he is doing, and for the first time, Thomas speaks straight again, saying that it is all his fault. Then, he jumps into the water, so Simon has no other choice but to save him. They take him inside the facility and Thomas is visibly traumatized just by the sight of the place. When they put him down to sleep, Simon tells Amanda that he thinks Thomas knows something about the creature in the research facility. Meanwhile, Tony has already assembled a team that will go back to the Caribbean island so they can finish the hybrid once and for all. The next day, Puckett finds out that all of his traps are damaged and thinks that Simon is sabotaging him. However, on the other part of the sea, Simon and Tall Man also see a destroyed trap and a horrible realization dawns on Simon. He thinks that the creature is the one who wrecked the traps as it finally learns that only one species can kill it, which is humans. When he goes back to the research facility with Amanda and Max, they see Thomas opening a hatch. Seeing how broken and desperate he is, Simon lets him do it, while he and Amanda go down to find out what Thomas wants them to see. Down there, they find themselves in a half-flooded tunnel that seems to be connected to the sea. Searching around the area, they discover a room with animal fetuses and a journal that most likely belongs to the late Dr. Ernest Bishop. Simon skims a few pages and decides to take it with him but when he turns around, he cannot find Amanda around. Nervous, he quickly gets out of the room and calls out to her, only to find Amanda outside looking at some cages. At this moment, they hear a noise that is echoing around them, but another jar of animal fetuses floating in the water they find distracts them. However, this fetus is not a known animal to any of them. Looking around, Simon finally realizes that the cages around them are actually Puckett's trap. 
Suddenly, the creature emerges from the water and attacks them, wounding Amanda. Seeing this, Simon quickly helps her to run, picking up Irma's journal on their way. The creature follows after them, stopping the metal door that Simon is about to close. As they finally get out of the flooded area, the two feel relief, thinking that they are already safe. Checking on the creature, they see that it followed them out of the water, causing it to struggle as it starts suffocating. They also finally get to see its full form, a shark with an amphibious body. Just then, Max shows up and sees the creature as well. When it collapses on the floor and stops moving, the family thinks that it is already over so they head out of the tunnel. Thomas, who is waiting at the entrance, helps Amanda. But just as they think that the creature is dead, it starts moving again and sheds its skin. The creature also makes its arms and legs bigger as if they are of humans, and finally, it starts to breathe air. And as Max takes a last look at the creature, he discovers its new form. As it snarls at him, Max calls out to his father and they run in fear of the man-shark standing right before them. Luckily for them, they manage to get out of the tunnel and seal a hatch as Thomas gets the final look at the creature. Thomas freaks out, saying that it is not supposed to happen. The movie ends with the cliffhanger that a more dangerous creature is born, ready to take anyone's life as it wants, roaring in the middle of the night. If you get into this film thinking that you will have a full conclusion in the end just like a normal movie would do, then you are wrong. This film is the movie version of the miniseries Creature that was released in 1998. The slow pacing and cliffhanger ending aims to hype up the audience to make them want to watch the series in order to see the ending of the story. Overall, as a movie, it's close to decent but still lacking.